was governor, I was introduced uh, once by somebody who said uh, that my time in office epitomized the true definition of the term governor. So I was telling my wife uh, that night at dinner, oh, I had a really nice introduction today. And she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, they said that uh, my term in office uh, epitomized the definition of governor. She said, well, you got to look up the definition of governor. <laughs> well, I went to the dic dictionary, opened it up. There it was, governor, something you install to inhibit peak performance. <laughs> <laughs> So you can tell the legislators laughing at that. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, let me uh, let me say so. Uh, I, Lowell, I appreciate you being careful with your words and introducing me. But you know, this is uh, is a, a labor of love for me. I have been um, working on college and career readiness for probably 30 years now. In fact, I even wrote a book on school to work transition 20 years ago, uh, calling for. Uh, an Americanized version of the European apprenticeship system, saying that ought to be a part of the opportunities for young people in this country. And I talked about it in terms of the importance of having young people have both experiential learning and a seamless transition to post-secondary education as part of that so they get the skills that uh, are going to be needed uh, in, uh, in the modern economy. And uh, somebody at the chamber was saying to me the other day, you know, Governor, uh, you might have been ahead of your time. A lot of people are talking about that apprenticeship idea again. You ought to talk to the publisher about maybe uh, republishing that book. And I said, uh, Jason, I think that publisher feels they've lost enough money on that book. I don't think they're <laughs> going to be looking for a new edition. Um, but it is such an important issue that um, I'm so appreciative of, uh, of Governor Bush uh, including uh, on the agenda of this important conference, uh, career and technical education, because I think it is going to be one of the major determinants of our future standard of living uh, in this country. You know, if you think about it, the Great Recession in the, in the 2008 uh, really changed the employment picture in this country. I mean, just think about where we are now. We have, what, 10 million people uh, unemployed? Well, BLS just released some statistics a couple of weeks ago that there are 4.8 million unfilled jobs in this country because of a lack of workers with the skills to do those jobs in that geographic area. That's like 5 million jobs available that people aren't qualified for. Just think about how different America would be today if we had even 3 million of those, of those jobs filled. It would be a different America. It would be a different future. Uh, that we would be looking at. And that's why I think that this is so important. You know, we have to realize that there are just too few high school graduates, too few even working adults, that are prepared for the technically complex jobs of this 21st century economy. Now, to show you, uh, there's some people here who are old enough to remember this, but uh, uh, in the early 1980s, the futurist uh, John Nesbitt wrote a book called Megatrends. And uh, he talked about the, what we could expect for the future. And there's a, there's a line in there that I've remembered for 30 years now. And it was that there will be jobs available in America in the 1990s. Remember, this was in the 1980s. There will be jobs available in the 1990s. But who will possess the high-tech skills to fill them? How prescient. Now, we got through the 90s, and we got through the first part of, uh, of the 21st century until the Great Recession. And now we sort of look at our coming out of this, we look at how our economy has changed, and we realize how important this question of career and technical education is. So the purpose of this, uh, of this panel discussion uh, today uh, is going to be to uh, discuss how states can make the kind of investments that are going to tie the needs of the workforce to education because we think that that will help young people find better paying jobs uh, when they, when they uh, finish with their schooling and, in turn, that will change uh, our economy uh, for, uh, for the better. We have a distinguished panel uh, that, uh, that is going to uh, help us with, uh, with this discussion. And I will introduce them um, in the order that uh, I'm going to uh, call on them, mainly because of the way they sat down. Uh, although we were always going to start with Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer, uh, Jennifer McNally 
is the president of the Manufacturing Institute, and uh, she was uh, named president in 2012. She leads uh, the charge in improving and expanding manufacturing through education reforms uh, that support the next generation of manufacturing employees, critical because of the potential that we now see in the growth in that manufacturing sector. So we think that this is uh, incredibly important, and uh, Jennifer is so qualified to do this because she has been uh, an administrator for the U.S. Department of Labor uh, as well. Uh, the next two uh, uh, panelists uh, are going to be so important to our discussion, two people that uh, I admire as, uh, as elected officials because uh, we need more people of their caliber uh, being willing to put themselves up for election. I'll start with uh, Wisconsin State Representative John Jagler, who is sitting uh, next to, uh, to Jennifer. Representative Jagler spent 20 years in the radio uh, uh, news business uh, where he was an award-winning uh, anchor, reporter, and talk show host. Um, so he will clearly sound the best of the, of the panel. Um, <laughs> Sure. And uh, in uh, 2010, he joined the staff of uh, the Wisconsin State Assembly Speaker, and he is currently serving his first term in uh, the uh, in the in the State Assembly uh, in Wisconsin. And he is vice chair of the Assembly Education Committee. Uh, most importantly, he is uh, has just been reelected, and he will be starting his second term uh, when the next uh, session of uh, of the assembly is uh, is sworn in after the two after the 2014 elections. And saving uh, the best for last, uh, the uh, I was going to say the president of the Florida State Senate, but uh, as of 36 hours ago, he is now the former president of the uh, of the uh, Florida State Senate. Uh, Don Gates uh, spent more than 30 years in the private sector working to improve access to quality health care services. And as he was doing that, uh, he uh, recognized that uh, he really should be concerned with the quality of education. And he uh, ran for and was, uh, was, uh, was on the school board and then uh, became a superintendent uh, of a school district. And then in 2006 was uh, elected to uh, of the Florida State Senate, and in 2012, he became the president of the Florida uh, State uh, Senate. So he says now he's uh, just a backbencher, but uh, I think given uh, his expertise and his leadership abilities, uh, uh, he's going to make uh, a huge difference still, and we're looking forward especially to focusing on one of uh, the initiatives that, uh, that he embarked upon uh, when he, as a state senator. But first, we're going to start with, uh, with Jennifer, as I said. Um, a, she's going to focus on what employers and uh, the jobs that are left unfilled that I referred to uh, because there are no uh, qualified applicants means to manufacturing. And they've recently done a report, put some numbers together uh, on the skills gap and the impact on employers. So we're going to have her share some of those findings uh, with us, and then uh, we're going to uh, begin to uh, to move through what can we do about uh, about these issues that are so important to the future of, uh, of our country. So Jennifer, with that, uh, I know Thank you, you have some slides for us. So Thank you. I'm going to see if I can um, set a little perspective here from, from a single industry stacker, our nation's manufacturers. How many of you guys from manufacturing states? Everyone's hand should go up. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think in the end, it's really manufacturing that makes America strong. Not only is it the 1.3 multiplier, in every community, it's the 12 million, 16 million in direct manufacturing services. But what um, I equally have the opportunity to engage in global discussions, and something that I think we often lose sight of is talent is really a global issue. And the countries, and more importantly, the communities, because each of you guys competes at the community level for jobs, and the communities that succeeded it are the communities that will win sort of the coming jobs war. From a manufacturing perspective, we've been at this in a very focused effort. For those of you that are not familiar with the Manufacturing Institute, we're the education affiliate to the National Association of Manufacturers, and I often describe us as half think tank, as good manufacturers. Everything is evidence-based, as the governor said, you know, grounded in data. We've been driving a direction. Um, but in the end, we're where policy moves to practice. So it's in partnerships at the community level that change really happens in support of manufacturing. And I love the title of this, Not Your Grandfather's Workshop. I actually was one of those that did have shop. I've turned a bowl on a lathe. I 
still have that, actually. Um, and it is not. Manufacturing today is not your grandfather's manufacturing. And in fact, um, I often have the chance to interact with young people to ask them, so what do you think or how did you learn about manufacturing? And inevitably, it's what they learned in the uh, history class on the Industrial Revolution. I don't know if you've been into a manufacturing facility anytime soon, but that is not modern manufacturing today. It is driven by automation, integrated systems, a global supply chain, and it really requires a skill set of critical thinking, just-in-time learning, flexibility, adaptability, and technical skills. And that's a whole lot different than the education system that we receive applicants from, from a manufacturing perspective. And to put a couple numbers around it as we think about manufacturing as an economic driver, 80% um, of our nation's manufacturers today have difficulty finding quality workers. And we can call it a skills gap, we can call it a training gap, we can call it an economic gap, I call it a crisis. Because in the end, we need individuals with the right skills finding the right opportunities. And the impact of that is equally felt in the talent supply chain and our young people coming through when only three out of 10 parents would encourage their kids into careers in manufacturing. What's heartening to me is the more you know about more ma manufacturing, the more likely you are to encourage a young person. And the impact from an economic pers perspective is 11% lost earnings. So in manufacturing, it's costing real community value, real taxes, real investment, 11% of lost earnings. And it comes down from our perspective to three things. One is the image of manufacturing, and I will say we as manufacturers really have to own that. And we have to own that because if we are not proud of being part of this great making country, and we do not empower the individuals that walk in our doors every single day, shame on us. But we have to do that with willing partners at the community level and engage students and parents and teachers and counselors. And part of that is also the diversity of our workforce. Next is we need a quality education pathway. <clears throat> we have transitioned in manufacturing over the last eight years to think about how we engage with our supply chain. If anybody have a background in manufacturing, we are about doing more with less every single day. In fact, U.S. manufacturing and the bedrock of, of its competitiveness is our product and process and the way in which we do it better than anyone else in our productivity. So that is the single dis differentiating factor of manufacturing in this country is how we do that better. And we've engaged every part of our supply chain, but what I would argue is our most important supply chain, our talent. So we actually then, that leads us to, so we can engage them but what we really need is a policy environment that equally supports them. So I'm gonna highlight a couple findings that we have driven towards that are based in communities across this country in eight plus years of action on the ground where we in fact have seen policy leaders from the power of the pen to the, to the power of the phone to the power of administrative action drive change. And from our perspective, as we look at the image challenge, the quality challenge and what good policy looks like, it comes in sort of five buckets. <coughs> Industry-based credentials, the heart of this discussion is a new level of transparency in education. Industry-based partners, how we not just invite them in for uh, every six-month cheese lunch to tell them how great things are doing, but how we get shoulder to shoulder to have real conversations. And actually, there was a principal in Corning um, New York, where one of my former board members from Corning sat shoulder to shoulder who said, I feel like I'm Rip Van Winkle. I woke up and the world is a different place because 50% of the, the individuals applying for jobs at Corning couldn't pass the basic entry level exam. And those are the kinds of metrics that we're talking about. It's about how we get to deep engagement for better alignment for the good of manufacturing, but for the good of the community, the individual, and the learner. So on that front, we actually just released, and I know it will be provided to everyone, a state-by-state -state review of those five critical areas looking at industry credentials, industry partnerships, credit articulation, dual enrollment, and then states that have actually taken a comprehensive strategy in reconsidering public-private partnerships with their driving sectors. In industry-based credentialing, um, increasing the number of industry credentials as part of the academic pathway. We've been big advocates at the federal policy level that completion is not always a measure of success. Somebody, especially in a community and technical college, got a job, 
that was the front end of a career got credit and had a way to come back in, that's really important too, and industry credentials help build that pathway. Under um, industry partnerships, how we bring employers to the table, get to alignment of apprenticeships, big fan. If you're doing it and learning it at the same time, learning is meaningful. So we, how we have those more cooperative education environments to make it safe for employers. You know, one of the things we hear from employers all the time is, you know, there's a risk of bringing a young person in here. Let's mitigate those risks and overcome the challenges with insurance or with what the structure looks like. And I'm so honored to be with the leaders here that have taken steps on that front. Um, equally in credit articulation, um, we've suffered for a long time in technical education that it has been not considered as important as academic um, learning. And in the end, it's marginalized as either technical education, not for credit. And from an industry-based perspective, if it builds somebody's capabilities and builds the capabilities of the community and industry values it, it should in fact articulate into an academic pathway for an individual to advance. Because what we also know is we are a nation of learners and education is no longer a destination, it is a lifelong journey. So you need to have on and off ramps and things like dual enrollment allow individuals to come in and out of that pathway. And in communities or in states where it sits on the side, you know, shame on us as leaders for not bringing those pathways together to in fact connect our economic <coughs> path with our <laughs> academic path. And then we've seen a number of states that have actually looked at comprehensive strategies to better blend education and workforce development. And I would say in many of these strategies, states are on the early end of the journey. In fact, we have a newbie and a very seasoned, I've modeled much of what we've done after the great state of Florida. But we as a nation are at the point of, we can't just sit in a room and talk about it anymore. We actually have to move to action because if we don't, somebody else will. And it'll happen in competing for jobs at the community level, at the state level, or at the country level. Thank you, Governor. Jennifer, thanks. Just what we were looking for. We appreciate that. Uh, and I think a lot of people sort of understand uh, sort of uh, intuitively what the, what the problems are. You've sort of shown in your report exactly uh, what uh, needs to be done. So I think given the reference uh, to, uh, to Senator Gates, I think maybe we'll uh, jump right to him. Let uh, you give us uh, your experience. You've been a leader in college and career readiness uh, in the Senate, so uh, we'd love to hear sort of the Florida experience, and then uh, from there we'll, we'll go back to Wisconsin as well. Thank you very much, Governor. I just got, uh, got here on the airplane from Florida about two hours ago, so I'm not well informed about what's been said at the conference, except that I had a chance to look at Governor uh, Bush's remarks has, has anybody remarked on the fact that the other half of the hotel is occupied by the American Federation of Teachers? <laughs> These are not our people. <laughs> and Governor, with your permission, uh, we could just close down this conference now and just go over there and do a hostile takeover. <laughs> Probably be uh, more helpful than anything I might say. In Florida, in Florida, we found ourselves confronting uh, five big facts. First, half our high school graduates were not going to college. And that's in a state that has benefited from Jeb Bush's extraordinarily uh, successful accountability and measurement policies. Still, half not going to college. My guess is there'll be other states that'll be able to say the same thing. Half of those graduating from college couldn't find jobs in their major degree fields. That even came up in the, in the uh, Romney-Obama uh, uh, second presidential debate nationwide, both agreed. And then half of college graduates, according to studies I've seen, wish they would have measured in, majored in something else that would have qualified them for a job, and so they could have made more money. Two thirds of those who have taken out student loans in this country are either behind in their payments or in default. And in our state, the governor talked about 5 million job openings in this country. In our state, we have 230,000 job openings today in Florida. And if we could just fill some of them, 
our recovery would even be more substantial than it is. So, so what did we do? First, um, we, we recognized that the kind of career technical education that we had been offering in our state wasn't working. And, and Jennifer put her finger on one reason. Because it was marginalized, not only from a sort of sociological standpoint, you know, that's where we send the kids who, you know, aren't going to be on the football team, aren't going to be cheerleaders, probably can't get a prom date. We're going to send them to the VOTEC. And the people who are going to teach at the VOTEC are the ones that we dumped out of the regular schools. And employers wouldn't hire the teachers at the VOTEC. In fact, they fired some of them. That's why they're teaching at the VOTEC. So we found out that wasn't working for sociological reasons, but also we had created policy disincentives. As Jennifer indicated, as the governor said, we created a system of funding in a state which I believe has done well in improving academic performance in which we valued financially advanced placement, AICE, international baccalaureate, dual enrollment, anything else that we could think of that might move somebody toward college, we, we, we valued that at a much higher level in terms of our funding system than we did uh, career technical education. And so, uh, you know, I found out as a superintendent of schools, I'm not an educator, I was just an activist parent who kind of got dragooned into running for superintendent because our district was tanking. And um, uh, we found out, I found out as a superintendent of schools that, uh, that people do in education what they get paid for. And I found out something else. If you get everybody at the middle school together and you get all the parents and the kids in the cafeteria and say, now those who are going to be going to college, really good colleges, you go to that side of the room. Those who aren't, you go to this side of the room. Nobody's on this side of the room. In my school system in Northwest Florida, in the school that had the worst articulation rate to college, in December, we asked the parents of the seniors how many of their kids were going to college. It was 80%. 22% went. So we learned that if we bifurcate this debate and say it's career or college, we lose the debate. And if we don't provide funding incentives, we lose the debate. And if we don't have career technical education that's, a, that's relevant and rigorous and cool for kids, then we're going to lose the debate. So what we did in Florida, and believe me, we've made plenty of mistakes, and as president of the Senate and as the senator who sponsored most of this legislation, uh, my DNA is on all the mistakes. <laughs> but what we did do was to say every one of our 67 school districts we have a county school district system in our state. Every one of our 67 school districts will offer what we call CAPE academies, Career and Professional Education Academies. And uh, we, we set up a system whereby industry would provide the curriculum in each case. Industry would either train the instructors or provide the instructors. So candidly, get ready for some goodbye parties at the VOTEC because some of those folks are not going to be able to cross the river to the promised land. Some will, some won't. You have to decide who the school system is really organized for. And, uh, and industry would provide, in our system, the assessments, and industry would provide the credentials. We learned something else, and that is employers, manufacturing companies, or other employers didn't give a hoot and a holler about the credentials that we issued because they were meaningless. A high school diploma by itself today is Confederate money in Florida. It's interesting to have the South may rise again. <laughs> but the fact is that by itself, it doesn't qualify you for much. And, um, and, and, and so what we did is create a, a, a system where industry was really calling the tune in career technical education in a very profound and specific way. We took the decisions about what we would offer away from ourselves as educrats and gave that decision to those who had done a, a, an appropriate analysis of the needs of the local and regional economies. And boy, the first year, we had 952 kids in the whole state of Florida who were earning uh, industry certifications through career technical education. 
And I went to see Governor Bush, and he said, what's it going to take to get to 100,000? You know, 952 is nothing. And most of them were in my county. And so then we went back to the truth about money. And we figured out that if we provided weighted funding for those courses, that, uh, that uh, you know, the sidewalks would be built where the students walked. And so we did. We provided some weighted funding. And then we got some response. The next year, we had about 17,000 students across the state in career technical education. And then we provided more weighted funding. And we made sure that we had valid and reliable third-party assessment. And then we did what, what was kind of a freedom moment uh, for our state. We killed seat time. We took it out back and just shot holes in it. And we came to the conclusion that it isn't how long you sit in the seat, but it's actually what you can do. So that students could earn certifications granted by industry, assessed and valid by industry, and then move on to the next certification. And then we let the kids help us determine which certifications they were interested in that were needed by the local economy. So we'd have a confluence of those two customer bases. And then we found out that if we provided equitable funding, equitable weighting in the funding formula with advanced placement, we'd get even more performance. And so this past year, 352,000 students in Florida uh, were in career technical courses, CAPE courses, in 1,645 CAPE academies uh, all over the state. Uh, earning uh, almost 400 different industry certifications. But being good, you know, conservative legislators, we made sure that we put a cap on how many of those, uh, s those uh, uh, classes and certifications a student could earn. And so our students <clears throat> were bouncing up against the caps. And this past year, in, uh, in a, a dramatic expansion of our CAPE Act, we took the cap off. And we said, you know, you can either learn the basics of geometry using chalkboard instruction, or you can learn them by calculating the risers on a stair step. So maybe one of the big issues, and Andy knows this as a school board member from Monroe County, one of the big issues in creating career technical education that's meaningful is to work it into the school day, into the schedule. And if you're competing with band, you lose. You will lose. Do not take on the band parents. <laughs> Do not take on the band parents. You lose. This is a great political stuff for you, too, Representative. <laughs> so what we did was to figure out a way that career technical courses that were earning certifications and the rigorous and relevant increased standards that Florida was imbuing into our courses could be married so that a student could earn both a graduation requirement and industry certifications at the same time. And then, taking a page out of what Jennifer pointed out so well, we learned that uh, if we have students who are college bound, and, and we found out, by the way, that a substantial share of students earning industry certifications were now college bound as a result of being interested in school, um, we had to make sure that they, the, these courses, these certifications, would articulate to college credit. So working with our state board of governors of our state university system and, uh, and getting them by the budget so that their hearts and minds would follow, <laughs> we, uh, we now have 40% of our industry certifications that articulate to college credit. And now the College Board and the State of Florida have entered a new partnership starting this next year, which is CAPE Innovation, that will combine advanced placement courses and industry certifications, starting in microeconomics and spreading into other courses as well, as well, five courses a year for the next three years. So we'd have 15 advanced placement courses that are earning industry certifications so that when students show up at the University of Florida or Florida State or any of our other state universities, they not only have skills that prepare them for the workforce, but skills that will allow them to make their college education much more relevant 
and they've got a bunch of credits in their hand. And so we've created an economic security report that we send, uh, and we're, we're going to put it online for everybody in the state, but send it also to the parents of every 6th, 7th, and 8th grader, saying, if you decide to send your student to the University of West Florida and your student majors in psychology, here are their chances of graduating, and here are their chances of getting a job, and here's how much they're going to get paid. Our states have this information for the most part. We just don't put it together and share it. And that economic security report will help parents and students make choices, and it will help our universities and colleges decide that if they want to market to our students, they have to be able to answer those questions. We've done some other things as well, Governor, that maybe we could take up in the questioning period, but that's the architecture of the Career and Professional Education Act in Florida and how it's working. And Governor Bush said to me the other day, if you don't hit 500,000 students next year, Gates, I'm going to want to know why. <laughs> Good thing he's no longer an officer. You'd really be in trouble. He's still the real governor. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And he's going to have his voice heard whether or not uh, he's uh, still there or not. Hey, let me, let me ask you a question before we, we go to Representative uh, Jagler, because uh, uh, from the time that you came up with the uh, Cape Academy's idea to the time that you got to the 952, to the 17,000, to the 300,000, how, how long a period was that? Uh, governor, um, we, uh, thanks to Lowell Matthews, who introduced this session today, who was the staff director of the Florida Senate Committee on Education, thanks to him, we put the first piece of legislation together in the 2007 session, so it was implemented in 2008-2009 school year. And, um, and, and so basically, we've got about five uh, years of, uh, you know, of, of uh, learning from our mistakes and trying to make things better. Great. Well, I, I want to go to uh, Representative Jagler, and then we'll come back and talk about this once we hear what it's like to actually start one of these programs after Florida had been at it for a while in Wisconsin. And then uh, let's uh, let's sort of talk about uh, about the, the credentials and how they work as well. But Representative, let's talk to you. Thank you. It, you know, I don't know about you all from out other states other than Florida, but it's a little overwhelming, isn't it? All the <laughs> stuff that I, I see some heads nodding. It's like, well, where do we? Where do we start, right? Where do you start? And, and we ran into a situation in 2010 in the wave where our houses flipped. Our governor, Governor Walker, was sworn into office in 2010. And one of the reasons why is for the first time in a very long time, Wisconsin's unemployment rate was higher than the national average. And you take a look at that, and then you start talking with the manufacturers, as has been discussed, about openings, it's like, there's a serious problem here. How do we fix this? It can be fixed with, with just by the numbers alone and by the people we have alone. So one of the things that the governor did was, was form a council on a workforce and career readiness. And out of that came some, some legislation that went into effect last session that we worked on. And you say, where can you start? Where can you start? There's some things that we did that have some very small investments to start because let's face it, you got to start somewhere and, and dollars are, are the big hindrance on everything. But the first place that, that we worked at and started to look at as lawmakers came from just my own experience. I, I'm, I'm a, a young father, my, my kids now, I, I have a, a daughter who is a sophomore, my, my son, the, the youngest, is a, is a freshman in high school and it's the, the breaking of the stereotypes and it needs to come not just from one angle, from all angles. It's like, well, that's okay for, for those kids, but it, you know, my, not my kids. They're, they're gonna go to the, the, this is where my kid, this is the path mine is on, and that's okay if, if, if them over here you know, go somewhere else. And the breaking of stereotypes was very interesting because it, it requires some help from manufacturing. You, you know, you, the manufacturing its image yourself, you're right, you need to own it because it's not just a dirty, dark place anymore. Families need to know this. And, and when you look at situations where parents are deciding what classes their kids are going to take and the kids come home, that stereotype is pretty much broken now with our kids because they're eager to try cool things, neat things. And some of the innovative programs that are in these classes 
whether it's graphic arts or metal work or computer working, is some neat stuff to work on. So that the stereotype is gone from, from the kids' level, but maybe not on their guidance counselors anymore. So you need to look at where your guidance counselors are and, and where they're steering these kids, and it's college or bust, and, and get, break that mentality. And then you start to look at the parents and how to get them involved. And, and the community in which I live in, our, our tech education teacher is a nationally recognized one because he is focused so hard right now on breaking that stereotype by getting it to the dinner table, he says. We gotta get these discussions to the dinner table. Dad, you know what I just did? I did this in this class. And that's where, where the, the stereotype of breaking the parents is gonna be. But we started with some simple legislation this last time around, and I know we're gonna get into it in a, a little bit more, but the career and industry readiness, the, the certifi certifications, we passed a, a bill that had a price tag of $3 million, $1,000 for every child who graduated and graduated with an industry certificate in, in that field. We just passed this, this uh, last session, wrapped through. The dollars will be allocated in April. We're just starting to count up on how many kids been involved. 200 school districts uh, participated, over 3,000 kids participated. So we hit that $3 million level. It was that popular that fast. Now, one of the things that we had to do was identify which certifications were gonna be part of this program. And with that, we combined with our Department of Workforce Development to talk to industry, to say, where do you need help? And the list was interesting, because it started to get bigger and bigger and bigger on the certification list as we were going through this process of passing this bill and, 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 and looking at where these industry shortages were. And it surprised a lot of people and a lot of legislators because they would look at this industry certification, say, in uh, hotel management or, or in, in a tourism one, and go, well, we, we don't need that. But you know what? Our, in a tourist-heavy Wisconsin Dells area, they do need that. Uh, it, in, uh, in northern Wisconsin, in, even if it's certified nursing assistants, CNAs, down in my part of the, uh, of the state, we, we, we have, we're loaded with the school nursing programs. There isn't that big of a, of a gap there. But it, it, so it, the, the flexibility required the growing list of certifications that were eligible for this $1,000 that the school districts were awarded. And in, in, in my district alone, agriculture was a big one, and also manufacturing, machine shop uh, certifications came in. And partnering with this, the, the industry officials and partnering with companies to get these kids out of the classroom and do some of that work. We also uh, worked on dual enrollment. We passed that. And in an effort, a small one, to try to, to close that um, stereotype or break that stereotype, um, Wisconsin allocates a scholarship for the, the, the person with the highest grade point average, GPA, in, in, in a school. They get a scholarship from the state of Wisconsin. I thought, well, what about a scholarship for technical education students? And so we allocated that, a matching exact amount scholarship to say, here, look, here's a, just one way that the state of Wisconsin says this is an important thing. And, and, and another path um, that we did was we re required a third year of math for all of our students. But it had to be in a different field where, with, again, flexibility, where if you were, one of our districts has this great program where they actually build a house, where, where the students go out and build a house for Habitat for Humanity. Well, you're not doing algebra as traditional algebra, but if you're building a house, you're using math. So we needed some flexibility into allowing those kind of classes, computer classes, to become that third year of math requirement to give some flexibility on where it's needed. And the program, is, as I said, the, the on industry certification was wildly popular this first time around. We're just starting to allocate the dollars and, and try to figure out where to go from here, and, and again, where those shortages are, and how much they vary by each district. Great uh, segue uh, into Jennifer. So how can um, uh, employers help Wisconsin and even Florida school districts in particular with the right kind of, uh, of certifications and, and the right kind of credentials that they're looking for so this is employer driven? 
Um, that's a really great question, and um, what my colleagues have all both shared is every community is different. So I'd like to say there's a general roadmap. In fact, there is. Um, so the Manufacturing Institute at the national level, we went through a process based on a fairly detailed competency model put forward by the U.S. Department of Labor and Department of Education in partnership with industry that basically says, you know, at the foundation, first off, we need everyone to show up on time. Well, I'd say show up on time, ready to learn, and drug-free is where we take that forward in manufacturing. There's a couple more angles associated with that, but basic academic skills, workplace skills, and then you get into technical skills. And then from technical skills, you get into careers. And at the Manufacturing Institute in 2009, we took that model and we took a list of 450 industry-based certificates and certifications, and those words are important. I'm not talking about an academic 12-week welding certificate. I'm talking about a nationally portable, industry-driven American Welding Society certification. So we crosswalk those 450 certificates and certifications against that competency model and said as a starting point, we counsel states, communities, and, and employers to start with these 14. These 14 service providers from the American Welding Society to the National Institute of Metalworking Skills to the Manufacturing Skills Standards Council. So production, machining, welding, maintenance. There's a core set that leads to careers. And I often, to my employers who, God bless them, are looking for perfection, the longer we wait, the longer it's going to take. And what an industry-based credential does, having done the first level of groundwork, is give you guys a roadmap to say what's important here. Actually, in some parts of Wisconsin, the MSSC is used very extensively because it's heavy production. In another part of the state, it's actually NIMS because it's very machining and small job shops. And it's to get the big list and then say, here's what you're allowed to use, and then within that, here's what's right for my community. We've done the first level groundwork for you, but then it takes the conversations with the employers. And what's important is also educating the employers. And what the foundation of all our effort has also been the use of ACT's National Career Readiness Credential. And that's important because, as the governor said, a high school diploma doesn't mean the same thing. Or, Senator, maybe you said that. Doesn't mean the same thing from community to community. It's just a piece of paper. And tools like industry-based credentials give a starting point to get to that 80% all employers need. And then what do you do with the curriculum shoulder to shoulder to tweak it to meet the employers in that community. So hopefully that's some good guidance. That's helpful. And uh, Senator Gates, what about um, uh, the local uh, business community? Because they know generally uh, what it is they need in terms of skills for their uh, employees, but they may not be experts in curriculum and how do we teach this? Uh, how have you gone about addressing uh, the ability to get those kinds of, uh, of skills in the classroom to produce the kind of uh, potential employees that the employers are looking for? Well, we began the Florida experience actually in our school district, in the Okaloosa County School District in Northwest Florida before it became a statewide policy. And we did it when, uh, when I was superintendent, not because of me, but because of some extraordinary school board members and others who pushed this. Uh, and the way we did it, Governor, was uh, first, by going to our Regional Economic Development Council uh, to make sure that we were answering a question that they were asking about what employers needed instead of us sitting around in the education cocoon listening to the echo of our own wisdom. So first we asked them. And we did exactly what uh, Jennifer said. We, we began to focus on five areas in, in one school district. And, uh, uh, and, and then we, we found the industries that needed the, the, the skilled workers, and we said, we don't want a $500 sponsorship from you this year. We don't want you to come to a bunch of meetings and talk about what kind of cookies we're going to have at the next meeting. We're not going to do any of that nonsense anymore. Instead, what we want you to do is provide some hours of time of your lead folks to help us develop the curriculum around the industry certifications. The industry certifications and the assessments used for the certifications uh, drive the curriculum. You know, even, even I could figure that out. But we had industry leaders sit down, people who were shop foremen, uh, people who worked in, one of ours was aerospace. Uh, we had people from a uh, company that rehabbed helicopters. 
sit down with us and say, okay, here's how we apply these skills in our plant. And they worked, they either provided instructors or trained our instructors so that what was taught was sufficiently relevant that the students would be able to get jobs in those companies. And what we discovered was that we started with a cadre of students who for the most part had never earned academic honors before. Uh, these were students who were bored out of their gourd in high school or they were underperformers. And by the way, that's the worst thing you can do to a, to a teenager. I've, I've had two of them and that's bore them. So um, we, we, we worked on that and, and discovered a way then that, that we did what the students were interested in and what employers could teach us to do. And the consequence was that we had students who were ready to go to work, they got jobs, they were more likely to get jobs, they were more likely to get better GPAs than the rest of the high school, they were more likely to have a better uh, attendance record, they were more likely to have a better uh, discipline record, they were more likely to go to college if college was in their plan, and they were more likely to get a job and they were more likely to get more money. And we had uh, the Haas Center for Business Research do a longitudinal study of that and that helped set the stage then for our statewide policy. And that's one of the things representatives write. In, in legislatures like his and mine, you got to prove return on investment. And it doesn't do any good to say, well, if you put a dollar in, you know, sort of hazily somewhere down the line, it's all going to work out. We, uh, we had the Pearson View study, which was released in October of 2013, on uh, Cape Florida, and it showed just for IT industry certifications, Microsoft, Cisco, and AutoCAD, in the first five years of Cape, Florida students received $93 million worth of commercially valued IT training so that for every $100 we put in to economic incentives for the schools, Florida received a $4,300 return on investment in commercially valued training for our students who then had a greater propensity to get jobs in the Florida economy. We haven't skinned the cat, but we think that we've got our arms around it. Senator, if I may, you know, one of the things that you were talking about in, in getting business industry to embrace this, they desperately wanted this in our state because one of the concerns was, okay, this $1,000 per pupil, what if, aren't we just giving it to districts who already do this anyway? Isn't that just duplicating? In, in a way, perhaps it isn't, that's great because we're rewarding them, but in, in what we're finding is these industries can't get the technical colleges in our state to move quickly enough, to adapt quickly enough, to get that curriculum quickly enough. They go to, to our technical colleges and say, we need this. And they can't, well, it'll be, it's gonna take a year, we gotta get this approved, it's gonna be, it, it, it'll be two years. That's gone, those jobs may be gone by then. People were so frustrated uh, a company in, in my community in Watertown, which makes, started out making lawnmower blades in a garage and now is a nationally, uh, international company, Fisher Barton, they were so desperate for workers, they took a $1 million machine, a CAD machine and a robot, and gave it to our high school and said, here, get us some workers. Can you use this? And our, our district said, well, he, Absolutely, we can. We don't know how yet, but we'll get it done. Mm -hmm. And now, to you know, these these kids are working there. They know the machines already before they even go out into that apprenticeship program. So it's remarkably um, something that that's uh, desirable by our employers who realize that there may be some um, flexibility and, and some movement that they can do on the high school level that they couldn't do on the secondary level. Governor, one, one thing I did want to mention, and that is to Jennifer's point about about manufacturing. If there's an area in Florida that we're not doing enough in, it's in uh, manufacturing Cape Academies. And so uh, the legislature this past year decided to award money, specifically startup dollars for Cape Manufacturing Academies. But here was the trick. We didn't award it to the school districts or to the community colleges. We awarded it to a consortium of manufacturing companies and we said, you now develop what you want, and you go to the school districts, happen to be in my part of the state, helps to be Senate president. <laughs> and Sheer coincidence. I'm sheer sure. coincidence. <laughs> but the manufacturing consortium that then was developed was able to go to school districts and say, okay, here's what we want. 
here's what we want you to teach, here's who we want to teach, here's how we want this to turn out, and if you're interested, we'll give you the money on a contract basis and dole it out to you based on performance. And all the school districts came running like hungry minnows. If you'd have given it to us as school districts, and I'm a former superintendent of schools, a former school board member, we would have found a way to spend it, but it might have been driven more by kind of the, the educentric approach that we had to knowing what's best, as opposed to exactly what the representative is saying, and that is dealing with a real-time economic need for training that produces jobs. So, Senator, just to build off that, and I think we cannot underscore from, from this table that incentives matter, that until we have the incentives aligned to the outcomes we're trying to achieve, a nice grant, which a lot of them are good at getting, doesn't change the system. And to the point, actually, we have, and we just released at the NAM from a board level task force, a call to action that says, you know, here's who you call in your community. Here are the questions you ask. You know, telling manufacturers it is time we take back this conversation. And it ends with, and if you don't get the answer you want, go down the street. And I actually have experienced that with a group of educators where they said, yeah, you too, Jennifer, for $10 million can have this problem solved. I thought, first, I don't have $10 million. Second, it's your job. And third, I'm going down the street. So we were in a virtual conference call, and we took a break, and everyone was going to the bathroom. And I said, okay, we ready to call the next college? I'm done with this. It's amazing how when we got back on the phone, they were ready to move. And that program was up and running in 12 weeks. And change is, in fact, possible if you have the right incentives and the right leadership. And this is a leadership issue. It's a leadership issue and in the education side. It's a leadership issue from parents. It's a leadership, it's, it's a tripartite compact here that we're talking about. And you need everybody engaged in that process. And it empowers school boards. Don't feel like if you're a school board member or a superintendent in the room, like, oh, these guys are out to you know, rip my scope of authority away from me. It's not that way. The more that you involve these other parts of the local and regional economy in your school district to produce results that you can be proud of and talk about and that result in people getting real jobs in the real economy, the more powerful you become and the more successful the school district is. For, uh, for Don and John, one of the big issues, it seems to me, is that there are never enough dollars for education. So uh, when you think about all the different stakeholders uh, in, the, in the education ecosystem, um, how do you uh, allocate the resources and get enough people to want to do these types of incentive programs as part of the education funding and, uh, and get legislators to vote for these types of programs if it means that you can't uh, increase uh, the numbers. I was hoping the senator could give me the secret here after <laughs> we leave. Uh, we had to start small. The, the Wisconsin program wasn't, you know, $3 million, that's, that's depending on which legislator you talk to, that's either a great deal or it's uh, not a good enough start. But when you started to talking have these legislators go out and it suddenly I, I don't know if, if you've been watching the news in Wisconsin we, there's not much that's agreed upon on both sides right now these days <laughs> but the skills gap was something that everybody agreed on and again it was from every different kind of uh, path the one thing that I, I mean our legislation's not perfect it it, it has a, a three million dollar cap meaning that thousand dollar per pupil well if you have four thousand kids guess what it's gonna it's gonna go down it also um, perhaps was a bit too broad in the types of certifications that, that were there. Um, and, and one of the things that, uh, that it, it was going to sunset because we wanted to see how, again, you got to prove it. And, and I think we're, we're there when, as far as uh, proving that this is something that's desirable and working. But getting, getting the votes, this bill uh, passed unanimously in our House and the Assembly. It passed unanimously in the Senate and really with very little discussion because everybody recognized it as a starting place to reward these school districts. One of the things that also uh, was talked about um, with our, our bill, it didn't say to the school districts what they, had, they could do or needed to do or have to do with the money, which made it much more <laughs> in, you know, it, it got much more support on the school district level because it gave them, again, flexibility. But perhaps uh, if we wanted to reward it, we should perhaps target it 
and maybe maybe that that was one of the, one of the things that we should have done is targeted so it goes right back in to these certification uh, in curriculum senator i mean once you hit governor bush's uh, 500,000 students here in the next year uh, which i'm sure you will do uh, then you're starting to get up into some serious money i would think so that's right uh, governor. what happens uh, to uh, the debate in the legislature on what gets funded when you start thinking about that number of students well first uh, uh, governor uh, just the representative uh, lowell matthews can tell you our first year in florida six hundred thousand dollars so we started very small and the key for us was bipartisanship not to make this i happen to be a republican but this could have easily been a democratic initiative and we made sure it was bipartisan from the beginning and bipartisan now. I'll tell you where the opposition came from. The opposition came, and Lowell re will remember this, from the entrenched uh, technical education people who said, whoa, 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 I don't have any of those industry certifications. <laughs> but yeah, I, I took superintendent fishing, and I got the job, and I'm keeping the job. And uh, uh, fishing, I'm sorry, Andy, fishing's good. Fishing's good. Andy's a charter boat captain. <laughs> but but the, that's, where we got the, uh, that's where we got the pushback was from people who said, we're already doing this, just send us more money. Uh, to your question, Governor, um, I think we have to continue to prove return on investment. And the way we do that politically is to not be the best debaters on the floor of the Florida Senate, but to have our manufacturers our, our Florida Manufacturers Association is now the loudest voice saying you've got to do more if you want to attract the right kind of companies to Florida and keep companies here. So we're being drowned out, Governor, by the business community who's saying this is more value-added education than other things you are doing. Because remember, half the kids aren't going to college, half the ones who do go to college aren't going to graduate, two-thirds of them aren't paying their school loans on time and they, they're not getting jobs in, in their major fields of study. So I think the key here is to build this fire from the bottom with parents who, um, who now uh, don't have to choose between college and career. Uh, their student is, uh, is getting skills that will help them get into college and get into a career at the same time. And it builds with the business community. If it becomes strictly political, then it's a budget food fight uh, which uh, we might win or we might lose, or, or, you know, and, and that depends on you know who the governor is and who's in the House and the Senate. I would say, uh, turn, you know, let let the business community lead the effort, and this will be well spent money. Let, let me just uh, follow up on uh, on one of the things you, you just mentioned about uh, more students even going to college. Um, a lot of the people that we talk with in the business community at the, at the U.S. Chamber uh, talk about the fact that there are very few jobs that pay the kind of wages that we ought to want for young people who are moving uh, into, whether it's manufacturing or any other field, that doesn't require some amount of post-secondary education in addition or as part of gaining those skills that allow you to get the credentials that you need. Um, can you, the three of you just sort of talk about your view of that? Because one of the things that I've been saying is that, uh, and uh, feel free to disagree with this, I'm not an office anymore either, so. Uh, one of the things I've been saying is that we always used to say, if you want to amount to something, you got to go to college. Uh, nobody really knew what that meant, except they thought it must mean four-year college. I, I've always thought, in the, uh, since the turn of, uh, of this century, that in the 21st century, we need to have a different way of saying that. And we need to say that everyone needs to go to college. But in the 21st century, college is whatever amount of post-secondary education you need to do what you want to do. Because there's very little likelihood that anything that you want to do is going to require no post-secondary education. And it might be six months. It might be eight years, depending on what your, uh, your interests are and your talents are. But, but how, how do we address that issue? Because I think that's one of the things, and you talked about the fact that everybody, no, nobody was on this side of the room. And I think that until we can grapple with that, uh, we're not going to have uh, the numbers that, that we really need. I'll start, um, and I'll also say I think it's an economic development issue, too. I mean, it, and it also, if you balance it against the reality of student debt today. And I'm going to go straight to the heart of something I know you care about, apprenticeship. 
and a structure by which, and call it apprenticeship, call it internship, call it work-based learning, I don't care what part of the country you are, meaningful <laughs> academic linked to employment opportunities. And time and time again, that's where rubber hits the road and where students have the opportunity to earn and learn concurrently. And I think that really is the secret because, again, back to we are a society of lifelong learners. We're never going to win the no college. But we will win the debate and actually have a niece who graduated high school having gone to a technical school, having taken AP classes, and having gone to the community college, entered after high school her second semester um, sophomore year into college because she had that many credits. I think at the foundation in the ninth through 12th grade, start to get them exposed, start to get them dual enrolled. If they're taking technical classes, they should be earning credit so they're not repeating those. Something I love about Florida is if I walked in with my MSSC certification, I've got 15 credits and I'm not taking any of that over again. And that's incredibly unique across this country that we are defining the value of the knowledge from a competency base. So having the learning pathway be appropriate to the job pathway so that if it's a six month training program, high school a certification and then they go back a year later, they can hop right back on that learning pathway and advance. But I think you need all three of those components. You need the dual enrollment opportunity. You need the benchmarking of things like stackable, portable, industry-based credentials. And you need the labor market outcome because that in the end when you talk to a parent and there was a young apprentice um, who was just interviewed on a story out of North Carolina, Central Piedmont region on CNN. It just released this week. And as he was being interviewed and talking about his apprenticeship program and how at the end he was going to not only graduate with his associate degree, and he started in his high school year. So he was going to graduate with an associate degree. He was going to be debt free. And they said, so you're going to be buying a car. He's like, no, I'm going to be buying a house. <laughs> I'm going to be buying a house at 21. So if you think about that and you think about the engagement, how many kids are living in parents' basements today? And how many veterans are returning that have no easy pathway back into the labor market? These tools allow that success to happen. Let, let me just, uh, we've been having such a good time up here, I don't want you to think we're ignoring you. Um, and we have about 10 minutes. If, uh, if there are people who have questions, we have two microphones here. Uh, and uh, as you probably figured out, we can keep going forever. So uh, I want to make sure we leave some time for, uh, for uh, all of you, too. Yes. So you've all talked about um, a key part of the program being let the industry and, and the technical people decide who teaches those, those courses. And I know hopefully you fixed it in Wisconsin in 2010 because I was out there around then. And the, the problem with um, some of those, port, uh, there's a district in central Wisconsin that had a program like that where it was a construction trades where they had the, mm -hmm. the people who actually trained the apprentice programs in carpentry and electrical and plumbing could not teach those same kids, those same classes in this high school because they didn't have the right certification. Um, how have you addressed that in Florida? Have you addressed it in Wisconsin? Because that keys off what we just heard in the last general keynote, that people who are trained as teachers are not necessarily the right ones for this part of the teaching job. It's, it's okay. almost as if you're looking at my desk. Short so we can we get some people here. It's almost we'll as if you moving. looked at my desk. Uh, we <laughs> haven't fixed it, but I'm working on it. Uh, as far as you know, teacher accreditation, uh, it, exactly that. It, it hasn't been fixed yet. We sent them home. We did. We sent them home. We sent the people who were not qualified home. We said, I'm sorry, you're, no long, you're not qualified to teach this new course that leads to these industry certifications. We'll train you if you want to be trained, but if you don't want or you can't, then we're going to send you home. And I've heard from four teachers that knew I was coming out here when, when, when uh, word came out that actually have gone through NIMS accreditation to, to get it themselves. Mm -hmm. To, to know what the program's like, for one, but also to show these kids that they're going to have this for the rest of their lives. Let's go over here. Hi. Um, it's a two-part question. One is, I wonder whether the sort of bias or misconception about, um, about CTE and, whether, and its comparison to college might be based a little bit on parents' generational memory of having really good manufacturing jobs that then disappeared. Sure. 
And then second part of that is where does entrepreneurship fit into this? Is that also a set of skills? Is that a strand in this that could potentially counterbalance that idea that you're at the mercy of a manufacturer who might not be there next year? Well, I'd say, uh, first off, um, I'd tell anybody that was in manufacturing today, if you assume your job's going to be the same tomorrow, assume you won't have one. Because the one constant in business, whether it's in manufacturing or any other sector, is change. Globalization is doing that. Automation is doing that. Technology is doing that. And we have a millennial generation coming in that wants to do something different every single day. So it's absolutely grounded in the parents' perception of reality. But I'd also say we have a huge problem with our adult population and their basic literacy as well. So they got good paying jobs with low skills, and that world does not exist today. And if we don't accept that, we will not be competitive. And Jennifer was right when she used the adjective portable to describe industry certifications. So it's not something that's tied to the local manufacturing concern or the local exactly. you know, right. medical device company. Medical. Instead, it's a portable industry certification that's good anywhere in America that that job is available. And, and that's what's critical not to have school district provided certificates. Those are worse than Confederate money, but instead- <laughs> I just tweeted you on that, by the National way, so. <laughs> industry certifications that are portable. Jennifer's right. All right, go ahead, over here. Captain Ed Davidson, the school board in the, in the Florida Keys. Uh, I think what we have is a marketing problem because there's still a pervasive mythology that you're gonna make a million more bucks in your life with a college degree. But the people have been saying that for generations. I remember that when I was a kid. Never counted what the kid apprenticing as an electrician or a plumber or a carpenter makes during the four years while his contemporary is running up now a national average of $35,000 in student loans, much worse. It's now over a trillion dollars, more than all the credit card debt in the United States. And that, that mythology and belief is still pervasive. And we have, we, need, we have a marketing challenge to, to explain this difference. Our school board attorney makes $10 an hour more than his outboard mechanic, but he had $100,000 in student loans to get through law school. So he'll go, you can go halfway through, excuse me, halfway through life in a, in a skilled profession before maybe the college kid, if they got a relevant degree, uh, catches up to you. And it seems to me it's a mythology and we, you, all of your efforts have to in involve a marketing campaign to change that erroneous public perception. And what are your ideas about how to best do that? I actually have talked to the National Ad Council uh, at the national level, and I think it's, it's the next, you know, I want to say Smokey the Bear or the Gut Mill campaign, that we need a general public understanding of what the career opportunities are. And I'd love to be selfish and say it's all about me and manufacturing, because it really is. Everything's about <laughs> making stuff. But in the end, we really need to hit that public perception, and I think that's a societal issue, and I've said it to the Secretary of Education, the Secretary of Labor, and I'd love to see someone like the Ad Council step into that. Maybe with the Chamber's help, we could approach them and see if we couldn't drive them that direction. In, in, in a way, the news industry is helping us with every story they run talking about this student loan crisis. Oh, yeah. it, 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 it touches, <laughs> every time that story runs, someone goes, yeah. We just I have to it. tie it into the opportunities right. uh, Correct. For, for people. And Captain, this isn't about college is bad or college is good. Mm -hmm. The fact right. is students who go to college and also gain skills can actually get jobs. Exactly. So it's not a matter of college or career. It's a matter of making sure that your education provides a return on investment. And the governor's right that uh, we need to make sure that uh, there's a post-secondary feature to training and education. And I would just say that the, the that college education starts in the 11th grade in, in many places now where you can earn college credits, you can advance your post-secondary education before you get your high school diploma. So I'm not against college education. I'm all about it. But I want to make sure that students will come off the college education graduation stage with skills that can make sure they can get a job. And starting in the 11th grade by taking courses that will give you college credit will also reduce student debt. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. Next question. The last question, I should say. Thank you, Representative Pebblin Warren from Alabama. I want you to know I took leave from my job today to come to this conference, but I just finished a manager's meeting, okay? <laughs> I work for AIDT. We're the state agency that's responsible for all state incentive workforce training. So we have to deal with the educational components as well as the industry. 
component. And what we decided is, you know, the, the South is really booming. Now, Alabama, we got Mercedes, Honda, Toyota, now we got Airbus. And what we realized, we, we were telling the industry that we can give you the workforce, and we didn't have anybody in the workforce to do it. So they hired me to come on to do the basic outreach, going out, dealing with the schools, dealing with the communities, dealing with people, just telling them what it is. And as we start working with the, our school systems, I found out that the, one of the main problems we have is truly the image because our counselors within our school systems trying to send them that this person gets scholarship, this scholarship. So what we did in Alabama, we put in our educational funding for career coaches. They are not hired by the school systems. They really are hired through the two-year system so that they can go visit the schools, visit the students, visit the homes, and just basically change the whole image because that's the only way we're gonna be successful with these jobs because they are skill-specific jobs that we're really talking about. And another thing that we've discovered, and, and you know, right now because of the diversity that we have in manufacturing, that's a whole different cultural aspect that we're having to deal with. So what we've done, we put a curriculum together with soft skills. We have what we call a ready to work program. And this program basically deals with all the little basic components. If we do a little measurement and, 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 and uh, we do safety, we do um, the, 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 the ethical parts of it. We even got to the part now we got a financial component because what we're realizing, a lot of people are getting jobs now who've never had jobs, so they really don't even know how to manage the money. Mm. So we, we are dealing with that. But um, it's, 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 it's a situation, and, and as I see it, you know, I don't know about other states, but Alabama, we're broke. We don't have any money. And as it relates to the dual enrollment, and with Florida, I picked up on dual enrollment in, in the two-year college system in Alabama right when Florida did it about 20 years ago. So, but what we, we decided to do to get the career people interested, we allocated funding and we opened a special account for dual enrollment in career education. And what we're doing, business, industry, private, anybody can contribute to this fund and get a tax credit. You know, just, just so we can get this money uh, to do this. And the last thing is to show you how important it is working with the, our high schools, we now require work keys for our graduation uh, attainment. You have to each, any student enrolled in a public high school in Alabama has to do um, ACT work keys to get some level of CRC. So for those that don't know work keys, it is the back engine to what I spoke earlier is our foundation credential that we have endorsed yeah. the National Career Readiness credential. So that's fabulous. So that's I, I think this, this session today has been, been very good for me. I'm going to go back and take my leave off. Hey, we appreciate that. Here you go. Yeah, you, you were doing important things today. And let's give a big round of applause for this panel. This was a fabulous discussion. And thank you for staying with us. I want to thank all of you.